with second row right, Bill Landis, Kings of the North. Hey, Chip, um, what did you learn, I guess, about Will and his ability to kind of be like a, a playmaker outside of structure through, throughout spring of the summer, but especially on Saturday? Well, I, I, if you had watched him against Case, I mean, watched him at K-State, I think you could see that, you know, he obviously can make plays with both his arm and his legs. Um, I think he showed some of that on, on Saturday, but those are things we were aware of before before we actually played on Saturday that I think he's a versatile guy. You know, I, I've talked about it before. He can really move for a big guy. Um, and he, he has a really good understanding of football. You know, he's got a lot of experience, and I think that's that kind of shown through for him. Um, he still needs to get experience in what we're doing, and that's part of the process. You know, playing the game of quarterback is probably the one position that's so totally different from a practice standpoint to a game standpoint because <clears throat> no matter where you are, whether it's in the NFL or high school or in college, you don't get hit in practice, you know, and, and, and in a game you do. So it's a different kind of mindset for him. Um, but I think we saw some of the things he can do, and hopefully we can build upon that going into week two. Fourth row right, uh, uh, Andrew, Andrew Gilbert, Cleveland.com. Uh, Chip, you had a uh, quarterback carries. I think it was Coach Allen who triggered on 13 to 10. Is that about where you want to be every week, or is it going to fluctuate? 43 and 40 would be better. <laughs> but I don't think we're going to get that many snaps in a game. So um, I, Carlos does a great job. Carlos Lachlan, our, our running back coach, of just keeping those guys fresh and who's in and who's out. And so um, there wasn't a set plan, but, you know, hopefully we run the ball a little bit more. Um and those numbers are up for both of those guys. Third row left, Andy Anders, 11 Warriors. And sticking with the running game, you know, Travion had a really efficient day. Quinshawn, um, you know, there were some inconsistencies on the plays with Quinshawn carry the ball. And I get there's a lot that goes into that beyond the running back. But is there something to a running back taking time to develop chemistry within a scheme, learning how, sort of the timing of winning the goals? Yeah, I mean, to your point, yes. Um, but I thought Q did a really nice job in terms of what we had designed. Obviously, he can't um, – he's not blocking for himself. So, you know, sometimes if something breaks down before he gets an opportunity to make a read, um, he has to adjust and work off of that. So um, – but I, I I think there's a point to that of get, getting the chemistry, getting the feel. You know, is our scheme slightly different than what he ran at, at his other school? You know, there are some nuances to that, you know, being in the – behind the quarterback and not offset from the quarterback, how much stack did they run when – you know, at his other school. So just getting comfortable in that. And I think that's the process that will continue to go on here at the beginning of the season. Front row middle, Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Chip, how much did you unveil in terms of the run game and all the concepts? How much did you maybe keep under wraps because it was the first game? How much did you learn about what your players can and maybe can't do? Uh, question one. Um, there, I don't think there's an unveiling or not unveiling. I think everything we do is just game plan specific for who we're playing that week based upon their personnel and scheme that they deploy. You know, so when someone says, hey, you didn't run this, well, maybe that's not compatible to their scheme or to their personnel. Um, so it wasn't like we held anything back or didn't hold anything back. It's That's the game plan that we put together to, to go against Akron. Um, you know, and I think I learned as, our, as the game got along, you know, we were probably a little shaky early. Um, everybody, you know, we had a drop early, kind of offset. Will started, you know, six of, six of 16, but then finished 11 of 12. So I think once he got settled, everybody started to get settled and get into the rhythm of the game. Um, they started to, you could start to see a rhythm develop in there because I think we were kind of off rhythm-wise early in the game. But I think as we started to get moving, especially, the, you know, those couple drives, you know, three-play drive to open up the second, you know, second half, um, starting to get some consistent runs and some kiss, consistent pass plays. I think uh, when we get into a rhythm, it can be a really good offense. Uh, front row left, Dave Biddle, 24-7 sports. Sure, but when was the last time you coached from the press box? And how did that go on? 2008 was the last time when I was a coordinator. How did that go on Saturday? What'd you think? Um, we have we practiced it, so we've been every time we've gone to the stadium, we've uh, had an opportunity to do that. So kind of got f settled and familiar up there. Um, it's a great view. Um, I think as the games get into October and November, people are going to be a little bit jealous of where I get to be on game day and and not on the sideline. Um, but the communication system, you know, so you're not right next to the coaching staff on the field, but there, there we had no issues from a communication standpoint, the ability to communicate that. So um, it, it was good. It's a different perspective. I think you can see the game better from up top, and I think you can feel the game better from the field. Um, and I don't think that'll ever change. So, um, but you can't because you can't be in both places. 
zipline that you talked about in the, in the story? I did talk about a zipline, but I don't, I don't think they've implemented that yet. We got to get Elon Musk on that, or it's one of one of those real tech guys. Right behind him, Jeff Gilbert, Press Bros. Um, we talked to Ryan about not calling plays and being the guy just contributing what he could. Mm -hmm. How do you feel like he did with that and just being in that new new thing for him? Yeah, he was great. You know, there were a couple of suggestions that we ran and we're good. And, hey, let's get to this. And like, okay, you know, that, that's exactly it. And I was maybe between one or two, but, you know, felt really good when he felt really good about it. So, um, you know, the, the communication in between what what they're doing, what what we think they're doing, you know, changing speeds, changing tempos, some of those things. I thought he did a really good job. But he's involved in with the defense with Jim and he's involved in the special teams with all the special teams guys too. So, you know, I, I understand that role because I've been in it. Um, sometimes you, you can't get to the special teams and you can't get to defense because you're thinking about what your next series is going to be like offensively and spending time with your offensive coaches. So, um, but he really contributed a lot on Saturday offensively. Right behind him, Dan Hope, 11 Warriors. For Tegra and Austin both getting in there of their first starts, just how do you feel like they played up front? I thought they did both did a really good job, you know, for their first extensive playing time up there. Um, you know, and that was part of us getting feeling our way through the beginning of the game. You know, it was Will's first game, Austin's first game, Tegra's first game, JJ's first game, Will Kismeric's first game, Q's first game. You know, there's a lot of guys first time stepping on the field in the horseshoe, and that's different. You know, you can go in there as much as you want from a practice standpoint um, and go against our defense in there, but when you get in there and there's 102,000, that's a, you know, you kind of catch yourself looking around, not looking at the field, but looking around the field. Um, just because of how, how, how amazing that experience is. So um, I think once those guys got settled, we started to get into a pretty good rhythm. Um, but it was there was a lot of guys that it was their first game, and, and that's to be expected. You being JJ's first game, what gave you the confidence to drop as many plays for him as you did in his first game? I've been around here since March, and, <laughs> and he's been doing a lot of really, really good things. So um, I don't think that was a surprise to anybody that – that he's going to be a featured guy in this offense. And, and uh, we obviously saw it, you know, besides that first drop that the rest of the game, I thought he played really, really well. Right next door, Tom Moore, Buckeye Huddle. Chip, we've heard a lot about the helmet communications. We haven't heard a lot about the specifics of what happens and when. So can you walk us through a play ends, you're figuring out presumably what the next play call is. Mm -hmm. When do you start talking to Will in his helmet? When do you have to let him start communicating that to the other guys? How much time do you typically have to maybe look at the, what the defense is doing and maybe point something else out to him? What Just what is that 30 seconds or whatever it is? Like? Yeah, well, you have from when the previous play ended till up to 15 seconds on the play clock. So, um, but I, you're not talking for that entire time. You know, you're, you're making decisions on what are we now? We're second and five, where's the ball? It's on the left hash. What, what play are we going to call? And then we're trying to get that information to Will as quick as possible so he can digest it. Um, if we're huddling and we've huddled, we huddled a few times on Saturday, then he needs to communicate that to our guys. Um, if it's a signal system, we make sure we tell everybody that we're using a signal on this play. Um, then, Phil, um, then Will has an opportunity to maybe survey the defense a little bit longer and get a chance to see that. You know, and Then there could be a check within that call. So the play could have come in as one play, two plays, or three plays. There's some three play sets that come in, and then Will has to make a decision at the line of scrimmage. What's the best play for us, um, and get us into that right play? So, um, our and it's not a conversation because he can't talk back. Um, but we try to be as brief as possible so that he gets as much information as he can, and then he can operate. Um, we didn't do any check with me's where we were making checks from the box. And he was just listening and waiting for us. You know, that didn't occur. We we have some plays in our system where we'll give him two or three plays at a time. And then he selects what the what the best play is. And in all of our checks, I think he, he did a really good job of that. But really, it's just giving him that information. So it's really not a conversation. And then letting him go operate with it. And then we talk extensively between series of, you know, what did you see here? Why did you go to that? And with the video, you can kind of confirm that, he saw what he saw and understands why he called what he called. Austin Ward, the podcast. Chip, do you guys have a nickname for the quarterback sneak package? A nickname? Yeah, like 
brotherly shove for the Eagles. Yeah, no, we, we don't. We well, I'll leave that up to you guys. Was it, okay, we can do whatever we want. Great. Uh, <laughs> what is it that would make that a, a meaningful weapon for you guys in the short yard situations? Well, you're just trying to gain a yard. You know, usually when you're using that, I don't think it's it's when you're farther out than that. But you know, I think the the technique and the mechanics of it, you know, and I think when you study the teams that were really good on Philadelphia being one of them, you know, their success rate is pretty high when someone's doing something at a really high success rate that you, you try to figure out how, why they're doing it, um, how they're doing it. And can you, with the players that you have, you know, implement that. So um, there's some positives to it. You know, we're, we're one for one on it. So um, as long as we continue to stay above 90%, then I think we'll continue to do it. Fourth row, fifth row, uh, right, Spencer Holbrook, throw in row. Chip, Ryan was really complimentary of the game that you called after the game. Um, everything that was going on, the first time you in the box, that's 15 years. Um, how do you feel like you called it? Do you feel like you called it a game? Nah, I thought we were just okay. I mean, I thought we could have executed a little bit better, especially early. Um, you know, sometimes you get caught up in are we really diverse and giving them a lot of different looks? And then are we, or. You know, I think really it's got to be focused more on our ability to execute. You know, what are, what's a better operation to execute? So, um, you got to be really self-aware when you're done. So, I, you know, the, to go four plays on the first drive and be out, well, that's not good. I mean, everybody can tell you that. So, so not not overly excited about that first drive. Um, the first drive at the end, the the drive at the beginning of the second half was Will and JJ just made a great play. That wasn't like a great play call. You know, that wasn't like, oh, my God, we really dialed one up. And there was a guy running clean down the field. It's, we'll, we'll put the ball up with enough depth and air on it. And J.J. made a great play on it. And then we scored a play later. So the, that was a three-play drive. But that wasn't like, hey, we were dicing them up on that play. So um, there's always things you can do better. And I think you're always going to be critical. And it's about execution, you know. And, and, and is everybody, not just the quarterback, but is everybody executing at, the, at what you need them to execute on? And if they're not, then what is the reason why? You know, were they confused with the call? Did we give them too many options? You know, did, did we not paint a really clear picture for them of how it's what it's supposed to be like when they, when they, when they get out there and run the play? So um, we can be better, you know. And I think that's it's a growth for all of us. It's a growth for our our staff being together for the first time in game like situations, you know, and for the players themselves. So, you know, there's that old adage that the biggest jump is from game one to game two. So that that gets you excited, you know, when you get back in here on Sunday and start the game plan for Western Michigan. Final questions, Tim May, front row. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Uh, what is the what is the communication like, the conversations like with Will, a guy who has played before? You understand what I'm saying? He's a veteran quarterback. I know he's at another school and another kind of offense and stuff. But mm -hmm. what what has that been like with him over the, I don't know, the last several weeks? But especially going into a game when you present him, sort of the game plan or your ideas and stuff. Yeah. Um, they're really congruous. I think everybody is on the same page and I think he knows what he does really well. And I think we have a really good understanding of what he likes and what he can do. Um, we're also aware of the weapons that are around him, you know, and part of a quarterback's job is you're really the point guard. You know, he does not have to be uh, Steph Curry where he's got to hit every shot himself. He's got a lot of really good players around him. You know, so his job is to get the ball in the playmaker's hands. Um, and that's part of how it's designed here. And I think um, he really relishes that. He enjoys that. You know, I, I think anybody would be excited if you have that trio of receivers or those two running backs behind them, you know, in that offensive line in front of them could be excited about playing quarterback here. So um, it's been really good. And I think he's he's mature. I think Will's got a real maturity to himself where he can tell you what he likes and what he doesn't like, you know, and that kind of occurs during the beginning of the week is we'll put some things in, you know, and he, he, you can tell maybe he's not sure about something at the beginning. Well, let's run it. Let's see what it looks like in, in practice on Tuesday. Um, let's look like some things we put out on Sunday night when we were in try. Let's take a look at it. You know, why are we doing this? We want to get it on film and get a chance to talk about it. Um, but he's been really good because there is a maturity and he's played a lot of football where he can kind of give his feedback in terms of what he likes. Cause it really, it never matters. It doesn't matter at all what the coach likes cause we're not playing. You know, I want to know what he likes and what he feels really comfortable in because that's what he's going to execute to the best. Yeah. There's a million questions. But I want to ask one quick, one other quickie. Did you find yourself Saturday when Quinchon's in the game thinking I'm going to call this cause Quinchon's in the game when Trey's in the game, I'm going to call this because Trey's in the game. You understand what I'm saying from a running I do understand aspect. what you're saying. Yeah, we really don't. You know, I feel like the two of those guys um, 
can both run inside the tackles. They're both tough, hard-nosed physical runners, but they both have speed and athletic ability to get to the perimeter. So, you know, they both had perimeter sweep runs called for them that they ran. They both ran inside the tackles and inside zone and counter. Um, so the, 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 the unique thing about both those guys is sometimes you have two different type backs. Um, I think with both those guys, you can you can call a similar game plan. And I think James Peoples fits into the same category. So when James got in there, I thought he was really productive in the, the, the small amount of snaps that he had. But for a true freshman to come in here and play like James did, and we, we think he's got a really bright future here, but it doesn't change with him in there either. You know, sometimes you may have a – you know, five, seven, 160 pound guy when you got to do a lot of free release and not pass protect. And, you know, obviously Q can pick up and then Trey did an unbelievable job and pass pickup the other day. So you don't really have to change what your play calls are depending on what not only the first two, but even when the third running backs in the game. Can I ask one more, how much, how much more of a hallelujah? Ask him. He's in charge. I got no, I got no juice. How much of a hallelujah moment is it? Uh, you, you really, Akron did some things that maybe you weren't expecting or they hadn't shown video. Maybe that's what, Will pointed out a couple of blitzes, things like that. But to have a video like Western Michigan having to having a game under their belt and fresh video of their 2024 defense, how much of a well, that helps start is because if you ask Wisconsin, I think Western Michigan changed defensively from the year yeah. before. You know, really drastically, they were a three-three stack team, and they did not play three-three stack against Wisconsin. So, um, now I haven't talked to the Wisconsin coaches, but I think it's not what they did when they were at Louisiana Tech either. So. Um, you got to go off of what they do for film, but you have to be prepared for everything. It's still 11 on 11, you know, so I think they can draw up some things and do some different things and they may catch you with something, but there's still a, a dynamic to how they're going to do it. There's usually four down guys and a couple linebackers and some DBs. So we're not going to try to overcomplicate the game too much if we can't. Coach, thank you very much. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks, Chip. Thanks.